Friday, everyone. Uh, here's a happy, shiny alligator for you, uh, welcoming you to another day in uh, CS208. Uh, any uh, questions about uh, bits, bytes, C, uh, any of the class logistics or policies uh, to start us off? Yeah, I was a little confused. Um, like I'm saying, like arrays can't be reassigned for their arrays. Yeah. Um. Yes. Yeah, so we'll see some things about uh, arrays in C in C today. Um, there are some like weird edge cases about variables that are declared as arrays that we're not going to get into because for the most part we don't need to, to worry about them. Um, uh, but in the scope where an array is declared, there are certain restrictions about what you can do with that, with that variable. Uh, but for uh, almost all purposes, uh, array syntax is going to be very familiar from, from Java. Uh, and what's new about it is going to be the uh, same thing that is most new about, about C to those of you who haven't seen it before, which is uh, pointers and working directly with, with memory addresses. Uh, other questions? Yeah. What are void pointers? Yes, yeah, so last time uh, we saw uh, int star p. Uh, which is the memory address of an integer. There are times when we might want to also express the idea of a generic memory address. A memory address without some associated information about what type of thing is stored at that address. Uh, and in that case, The type is void star, which says this is a pointer to an unknown type. It's called a a generic pointer. And this is generic to what kind of thing it could be. It could be, it could be pointing to. Uh, in order to uh, actually access the data at this memory address. We would have to cast or convert the type of this to something like an int star. Because without information about what type of thing it points to, we don't know how many bytes to read or write when we want to do something at that address. Uh, but this won't um, this will come up on some of the later assignments of the course where we just need to pass around a memory address uh, without specifying ahead of time exactly what type of thing it points to. Other questions? All right, let's do a little practice. We have seen that one. We're skipping these. All right, here we go. If the size of a pointer on a particular machine is six bits, what is the size of the address space? How many different uh, uh, slots are there uh, that we can give an address to? Yeah, cooperating. Uh, all right. Variety of opinions on, on this one. Please uh, discuss with your, your neighbors how you thought about going from size of a pointer to the address space and what that relationship is. So movement toward B, that is excellent. That is what we'll have here. Uh, can someone explain how, uh, how you thought about this, this problem? Yeah. So six bits can represent uh, two to power of six different um, memory addresses, and each one represents a byte. Uh, 
exactly right, that when we have six bits, that's kind of two possible, one or zero for the first, times one or zero for the second, times one or zero for the third, up to two to the sixth. Uh, and when we're talking about memory, each address is kind of the index of a byte in memory. So if we have two to the sixth or 64 possible addresses, each one will label a particular byte, giving us 64 bytes uh, in the address space. Uh, does that make sense? Questions on this? Yeah, go ahead. So I don't understand. So two to six possible values, wouldn't that be the amount of bits? So how do we go from bits to bytes? So if we have six bits, two to the six or 64 possible values, since we're talking about pointers, uh, when we say possible values, what we really mean is possible memory addresses. And if memory is this big array, kind of what, what is each cell, kind of each spot in memory that we give an address to? A byte. Exactly. Kind of each thing that gets a unique address is a byte in memory. We don't have addresses for units smaller than these eight bits, uh, than these byte chunks. Uh, so when we have 64 addresses, that means 64 different bytes, each with its own address. Yeah? You mentioned eight bytes. How does the eight fit in with this? Uh, one byte is eight bits. Uh, I think that's the context where, where eight came from. Uh, so the, the 64 bytes uh, is 64 times eight total bits. Um, but the fact of we know how many different addresses there are, and we know that each address labels a byte, means that there's one byte for each address in the address space. Kevin? Um, so, after last class, we were talking about how you said that the, the, the size of a pointer is determined by how like the, the word size mm -hmm. um, of the operating system, right? So if that was the case, I, 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 I guess I'm still a little bit confused about like why the cult six bits being the size of the pointer and not 64. Uh, so when we talk about the size of a pointer, it would be how many ones and zeros do I need to write down a memory address on this system? So this is saying memory address zero looks like this, six bits. Memory address one looks like that, uh, and so on, up to memory address 63 looks like this. So these are, each memory address is six ones or zeros. And this is our 64 different, 64 different addresses when we kind of write out all combinations of, of these six bits. Yeah, so you, you wouldn't find a, a, a real system necessarily that had a word size of six bits, but it helps us sort of link up these, these concepts we've been talking about. Other questions? Yeah. We just already said that, like, so each cell is that six bits then? Or is it the one? I mean, it's also one byte. There are two computers. That's right. So each cell is one byte. Mm -hmm. And the six bits are how many bits it takes to write down the index of a cell. So it's like we have, it's like we have an array of and the things in the array are one byte each. And then we, when we want to have an index into the array, this says the pointer is six bits, which is the same as like an index into the array of bytes that is memory. So the index into like, we wanted index zero, that would take six bits. There's a pointer is six bits. If we want index three, also six bits. Does that make sense? So, uh, 
if we think about it uh, in terms of, um, like if I had just an array uh, of ints, just for example. Um, I have, maybe I have 7, 22, 3, negative 5. And what would the index of this first element be? Zero, and then we have one and two and three. These are our indexes. Is this index, is the number one stored anywhere in here? And so the number of bits that we use to represent this index one is a kind of separate question from the number of bits we use to represent 22 here. So that's, that's the idea, that each kind of cell of memory is a byte, eight bits. And then the number of bits in an address or index could be something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the 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 size of a, a pointer takes up 0.75 bytes in this case. Yes. The like in this uh, made up system, our our pointer is is just six bits. Yes. So like the pointer isn't pointing to anything in this array, otherwise it happens to have eight bits. Uh. So every spot in memory takes, it, every index takes six bits. So a, a six bit number could point to something in this array. But to actually, to, to store a number in the array, because each cell is a byte, would be, would be that's where the eight bits would come in. Yes? I wonder if maybe this byte Exactly. So if instead we convert this, okay, our, our memory is an array of bytes, and our index is actually a memory address or another an equivalent term is, is pointer. So I told you that each of these kind of indexes, we would use six bits to write down the zero or the two or the three. Uh, and then for each of these, uh, each of these cells, each of these numbers, seven, twenty-two, three, five, this these would be the one byte or eight bits each. Other questions? All right. Um, I think I, okay, yes. Yeah, so before, um, so before we, we tackle this problem, there's one um, uh, bit of uh, pointer syntax in C that I, I need to talk about. So uh, last time we saw that uh, I declared an int x and then declared a pointer to an int p. I could say p equals the address of x. This ampersand is our address of operator, it's the address of x. Now, if I wanted to kind of get the value that p points to. So p currently stores a memory address, and that memory address points to where this number 5 is is stored, where x is stored. And I can use the asterisk, which is called a dereference to this pointer. And this says, take this memory address, go to memory at that address, and get 
the integer stored there. So this would assign the value 5 to this integer y by kind of using this intermediate sort of arrow, p is sort of like a pointer and arrow to where x is stored, go get that integer and then assign it to y. Yes? Why are pointers needed? Like, you can't just say, like, so in, in this small example, the pointer is totally unnecessary. We will see very shortly why we need pointers. Uh, but here, this is just to illustrate this syntax. This is not a case where we're doing anything that would actually require a pointer. Yeah. Um, another note, what well, we also learned by uh, n not not today. That doesn't come up very much. Um, but uh, an excellent question for for after class or, or office hours. Um, oh. Wait. So P is a pointer, and star P is a saying go to that pointer and get the value for it. Uh, exactly. If P is an int star, a pointer to an int. When we dereference P, we get the int that it points to. So you can just say int y equals p. Uh, if we had said int y equals p, uh, I think the C compiler would warn us that we are assigning something that's a pointer type to something that is an integer type. Um, that being said, the C compiler is totally happy if you just say no convert p to an integer, just force p into an integer and then assign it to y. Uh, and this is the way in which c will just get out of your way and just assume that, yeah, sure, you know what you're doing. You definitely want this memory address to be treated as an integer. So this syntax here. It's called a type cast, if it's not something that you've seen before. But you have a variable, and you want to have it treated as being of some type other than what it is. P is an int star. If I wanted to force it to be an integer, I could put parentheses with the kind of type that I'm casting or converting it to uh, in front of it. Yeah. So can you type cast it like that? Um, so so like if you do like that, right? That you know, y is going to be like some value in thousands, right? Just because that's the the integer representation of the address space at which p is stored, right? Uh, so p holds the address of x. Yep. And so this would be uh, uh, just the lower four bytes of that address, uh, treated as as an integer. Um, so if all like if bytes in memory are not like clearly like if they can be anything, is typecasting? Does it is it just like for the compiler to not okay, not like error? Yeah. So so typecasting is to uh, have it let uh, uh, have the compiler verify. Oh yes, both things on the side of the equals are are ints, uh, and also in this case. How many bytes would our would our pointer be? What's the word size in this case? Yeah, it would be the word size. Let's say it's eight bytes. Uh, how many bytes is an integer? An int? Four, four. Four. And so the other thing that this is doing is it's throwing away four bytes of the pointer to fit it into an integer. So typecast also affects sort of the size of the value. Other questions? All right, so last thing I need to say about dereference. We dereference on the right-hand side of the equals. We're kind of getting the int that p points to. Uh, we can also
the reference of pointer on the left hand side of the equals. And this is how we change the value that p points to. So this here actually changes x because p points to x and this says go to where p points to and store whatever is on the right hand side of the equals at that location. Yes. So would this work in like the other way around? So for example, if I change the value of in x, would x dollar p be Yes, exactly. The p is just uh, a reference, it's just the address where x is stored, so any changes to the memory at that location would affect both x uh, and, and star p. Alright, let's try some practice with this syntax. Have uh, a short C program here, uh, a couple integers, a couple pointers to integers, uh, so take a few minutes and uh, think through what this uh, will do and what it will cause to print out. Uh, and uh, then we will uh, see what we're thinking. All right, most of us thinking A, a few votes for the, the others. Uh, thank you for uh, agreeing that I wrote code that would compile. Um, <laughs> quick discussion with your neighbors just about how you thought through uh, what these lines of code are going to do. Uh, so movement toward A, excellent, that's uh, what this is, is going to be, uh, using this syntax we have here. Uh, any questions on, on this example? All right, so as uh, is the uh, tradition I have decided to adopt, uh, I now want to tell you about the first uh, contested uh, U.S. presidential elections that George Washington, unopposed, elected president twice, decides, much to, to people's surprise, to retire after two terms. Uh, and so we have uh, his vice president, John Adams, uh, running against, uh, well, running with Thomas uh, Pickney, uh, former uh, governor, I think, of South Carolina. Uh, and against Washington's former Secretary of State, who had uh, resigned when uh, Washington decided the U.S. would, would be, be neutral uh, in the French uh, Revolution, against Thomas, who was uh, running with Aaron Burr. And uh, this uh, election uh, broke down uh, like so, uh, with Adams uh, taking the victory. Uh, and at this time, each person in the Electoral College got to cast two votes, and the votes were equal. They, like, they weren't different from each other, and just the person who got the most was the president, and the person who got the second most was the vice president. Uh, and so even though John Adams was running with Thomas Pickney, you know, people were communicating by mail, the electors are, are voting in their own states, it's very hard to coordinate, so instead of Adams being president and Pickney being vice president, uh, Adams was president and Jefferson was vice president. Um, so bitter political rivals now in the administration. Um, I uh, don't want to imagine the kind of Biden-Trump uh, administration um, <laughs> that could have resulted under this system. Uh, so Adams uh, running for re-election in, in 1800. Uh, if you have seen the, the musical Hamilton, uh, they uh, dramatize this particular election. Uh, I don't know why, but Adams uh, dropped Thomas Pickney and picked up his brother, uh, uh, another, another uh, Charles Pickney, uh, as, as vice president. Um, and uh, this time Jeff Jefferson comes out with, uh, uh, with the victory. Um, and the parties had figured out, okay, what we're going to do is that we'll have all of our electors cast their votes for the person who's going to be president and then just have one person sort of vote for someone else for vice president. So that, like, Aaron Burr, Jefferson's running mate, would get one fewer electoral votes and then under the system become vice president. Well, whoever was supposed to do that forgot, and Jefferson and Burr get the same number of votes. Uh, so this is also now the first 
presidential election decided by the House of Representatives. Um, and uh, Burr didn't sort of step aside and be like, yes, I will be vice president. He was like, no, maybe I want to be president. Because, uh, you know, who wouldn't? Um, and uh, uh, the, the musical Hamilton dramatizes Hamilton's role in convincing people to, to make Jefferson president. Um, and so this kind of emerges from this is what's called the first party system. I think political scientists have labeled five uh, party systems throughout US history. Uh, but you can see that, that Jefferson's uh, party, the, the uh, Democratic Republicans, kind of really, like after Adams lost, the Federalists were, were sort of finished. Uh, they, they had a kind of some support in, in, in New England, but uh, you had kind of Jefferson and, and a number of his um, fellow, fellow Virginians uh, uh, elected president over the next uh, couple decades. All right, so that's, uh, that's our, our US history for today. So what I would like to do uh, now is to kind of go through another kind of example of how uh, uh, C code uh, interacts with bytes in memory. Uh, and through this, also talk about how do C arrays work and how do uh, strings in C work. So, to declare an array, I can use the following syntax I have an array. I call that variable A. It's an array of ints, and there are six things inside it. And in my role as the C compiler, I have just decided uh, that A is going to start at address hex 10. Uh, and this spreadsheet here is showing the, um, the kind of rows, kind of stacked rows of, of memory that I talked about on the board yesterday. So we're going to read them in a kind of zigzag pattern. So this is like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then this one is 18, 19, 1a, 1b, and so on. And I've outlined in, in red here the six four-byte integers that are in this array. That makes sense so far? All right, so the text that I expect will be familiar. I can say, okay, the first uh, uh, element of array uh, uh, of our array is going to be hex 0, 1, 5, f. And yes, you can write hexadecimals direct hexadecimal numbers directly in C, putting 0x uh, in front of them. Uh, and so uh, let's assume this is on a kind of nor uh, an x86 system like my laptop. Um, anyone have a guess for what byte is going to go at address 10? Five F. Why do you say five F? Um, if we said little Indian, then the smaller part of the integer will be stored in the smaller address. Exactly. That we're on a little Indian machine, and little Indian says our least significant byte comes first, and we kind of go uh, uh, from there. So we have 5f, and then 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. The rest of this array, we know nothing about what's inside it. It's just uninitialized. Could be all zeros, could be other data from some previous time this memory was used. Uh, it's just uh, uninitialized and, and unknown. And I'll just say a bracket 5 equals a bracket 0. So this, again, uh, would put our 5f Zero one zero 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 zero. Uh, unlike if you're uh, used to programming in Python or Java, uh, C does no bounds checking when you use array indexes. So I can say 
A bracket 6 is hex BAD. A bracket negative 1 equals hex BAD. So, any predictions for what this first, what's going to happen when I uh, uh, do A at index 6 equals, yes? Will it go back to 0? Uh, that would be a, a reasonable thing, but it will not. Uh, yes? Uh, it, you get a, you start getting into a segmentation fault. It starts reaching into memory it's not supposed to. Uh, yes, so this is definitely memory that it's not supposed to be able to. Um, but just because it's not supposed to be able to does not mean that it causes a crash 100% of the time. Uh, and in this case, let's assume it, it's not going to stop us. We're going to be able to, 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 to write to memory wherever this is. Yes? It's just going to overwrite whatever is um, um, 0, 0 x28 and 4 by something. Exactly. This is going to say, all right, I will put this value like six integers after the beginning of the array. Uh, so we'll have, again, in little Indian order, AD, 0B, 0, 0, 0, 0, show up there. That makes sense. I mean, it's not it's not good. Like we avoid you know C having to check is this an OK array index, but it also means we can uh, do do mischief in memory. Uh, how about index negative one? Any predictions? It's one before the beginning of the array. Exactly. It's just going to go. It's gonna. Oh, you mean one integer? Minus, like minus one integer before the start of the array. Uh, zero, A, A, D, zero, B, zero, 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 zero. Questions so far? Yes? Uh, so when we declare int A, uh, when we declare the array, did it just randomly pick a spot where we wanted to start, or is that? Uh, not randomly, but the compiler will just, yes, pick a spot. And in my role as the compiler, I picked hex 10, where it would start. Uh, is there a particular reason why the array allow why the C array allows like the negative in index? Uh, so there's a trade-off here. Uh, in Java, for example, every time you index an array, it checks is this a valid index. So there's some extra work associated with every single array index checking whether it's a valid index. C says I'm not going to check. I'm just going to treat that as kind of an offset from the start of the array. And so you save the work of having to do those checks, uh, but now the kind of burden is on the programmer because the language is going to allow us to, uh, to do very strange things. Yes. Uh, what happens if we go above like the amount of space we have if I put an index that can't be reached by the compiler? Like, uh, out of the array. Yes, great question. If we if we have an index that gets us to memory that doesn't exist, memory that we're not allowed to access, um, Uh, the program, the operating system will uh, terminate the program uh, with what's called a segmentation fault. The program will just be halted, uh, and then and a message about a segmentation fault will, will show up. Um, the most common reason for a segmentation fault that you will encounter is dereferencing a null pointer. So there's the value null, in, uh, which is uh, kind of a, a built-in thing in C, all it, it's literally just zero. It's just like a way to express a memory address that is zero, that like doesn't point to valid memory. And if your program tries to read or write address zero, the operating system will say, no, 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 and shut down the program with a segmentation fault. So if, if you start working on lab one, we're seeing segmentation faults most likely 
you are dereferencing a, a null pointer. Other questions? All right, so uh, just for in the interest of time, uh, I will say uh, get to the part where I'm talking about uh, strings in C. Uh, all a string is in C is an array of one byte characters. Where each element of the array is one kind of letter or one character of the string. So if I wanted to declare a string S and set it equal to a very excited hi, to write it like this, I don't have to put the size in here because I'm immediately setting it equal to a particular string. Um, and uh, in my role as the, the compiler, I decided to put this uh, uh, variable, this array str, at address 30. And uh, now each Kind of one byte at a time, I'm going to see the, kind of the, the ASCII values uh, for each of these characters. And this is a very, uh, a very important uh, point. about little Indian versus big Indian, this is about the bytes within a single value. So about the four bytes within an int, or the eight bytes within a pointer. But if we're thinking about the elements of an array, the element in index zero, the first element of the array, is first. The second element is second, third element is third. Indianness is not about the order of array elements, only about bytes within an individual value. So this is to say that we would see hex 68, which is the lower case, which is lowercase h, hex 69 for lowercase i, and hex 21 for each of the four exclamation points. Now, looking at this memory here, is there anything in memory for either of these arrays that tells us how long the array is? How many elements are in the array? No, there's, there's nothing in memory that uh, tells us how long the array is. And so when we have this string, we need some other way of knowing where is the end of the string. Like, otherwise, we just like keep reading bytes forever. We need to know like where to stop if we want to read the bytes in this string. Uh, does anyone know how uh, C notes the end of a string? Yeah. Um, I think the reading says something like 0x00. Zero zero zero, like yes. The last byte of a string is what's called the null terminator, which is just a byte that is zero. Uh, so we can write that hex zero zero. Uh, if we want to write it as a character, it is single quote backslash zero. So if we want to write int expressed as a character rather than just as a, as a number, uh, that's how we would write down this, this null terminator. Uh, and that's what C will use to, to tell when a string is. Yeah. Uh, does it matter if we use double quotes for this, or like character? Uh, double quotes are strings, single quotes are characters. They are not interchangeable. 
So if I put double quotes around this, it would be a three character string, a slash, a zero, and an L terminator. If I put single quotes around it, it's a single character. C, the C compiler will not let you put single quotes around anything that's more than one character. So we'll say that's, that's not valid C. Other questions? Yes. Um, just to make sure. So that means that each, the size of the string is always the amount of characters like that you write plus one, right? Yes. And there's uh, a function that may be useful on the lab uh, that's from C, uh, the C library, strlen, that you can pass the uh, uh, the string and it will return the number of characters in the string, not counting the null term. Yeah. Does C also store null terminators for um, arrays and other sorts of types? Uh, no. There is no like special value marking the end uh, of any arrays other than strings. Um, one reason for that is uh, for an integer, every possible combination of these 32 bits is an integer we would like to be able to represent. So there's like not any combination of the bits to make up an integer that could signal this is the last thing in the array. Which means if we're dealing with, uh, if we say we want to pass an array to a function, we also have to pass its length if the function needs to know it, because otherwise it, it doesn't have that information. All right. So uh, I want to. Um, at least start walking through an example. Um, let me consider. Yeah, all right. Um, I think I will save the kind of extended example for Monday. Um, and so that means that on Monday we're going to cover more stuff about C that you'll need to do the lab zero that's out today. Um, so uh, I'd like to do a quick walkthrough of how to uh, on how to get started on the lab, and then uh, we, we'll do a little practice if we have more time. So uh, if I go to the course calendar, you can see that lab zero is here. Um, so all labs, let me make this a little bigger, uh, all labs will kind of start with this sort of manifest that gives the relevant dates, uh, whether it's individual or you can work in partners, uh, information about submission, uh, a link to the, the starter code, uh, and then a list of references uh, which, may, which may be useful. Um, the references for uh, Wednesday's class and today's class and the reading certainly useful. Uh, I'll link to a site. Uh, it's called c++.com, but it also has it's also a great reference for C uh, for C functions. Uh, and I've linked to the C library function store for strings, which may be useful uh, in the lab, um, and and some resources about linked lists and uh, and C as well. So. Your task for this uh, for this lab is going to be to implement a uh, a linked list of strings, uh, and uh, each um, uh, each node in the list will kind of have a pointer to an array of characters. That is uh, the string stored uh, in the list in that location. Uh, you'll keep track of the head of the list, the tail of the list, um, and you'll be implementing functions uh, to use this link list as a double-ended queue, meaning that you can add to the beginning or the end uh, of the queue. So uh, the uh, instructions to get started, um, I would start out in VS Code uh, and uh, you are not required to work on, on Mantis, but uh, that kind of already has everything configured that you might need, so not wouldn't be a bad choice. 
so I would connect to um, to Mantis and on uh, Monday I went through the steps uh, to kind of add a new host if you haven't connected to Mantis before um, and once it uh, once it connects I will um, should open up something over here that will let me open a folder. Um, and so I will uh, go into documents, go to CS208, um, open up that folder. Uh, yes, that is an excellent point. Uh, so I'll make a nope. Make a folder for this term, and then I will pull up a terminal. And so the lab uh, uh, write up. Uh, suggest to you can there's a link to download uh, the starter code directly but you can also run this wget command in the terminal which is just a way to download a file um, uh, in the in the terminal so paste that in it uh, so that link is wrong I will fix that I think you, you just directly go to the starter file link uh, yes, uh, that link may be correct, um, but if I manually change it to the right link, the assignment will be updated uh, shortly. Uh, I see that lab0-handout.tar uh, has shown up. I run ls to list the current files in, in the folder. I can see it there. And I can go back to the handout. This command is correct to extract all the files uh, from, uh, from the handout, which I can see here. Um, and uh, let me make this not tiny. All right, so uh, there are a lot of files here. Um, the only one that you need to modify is q.c. All the other files are uh, for the, the automatic grading that comes along uh, uh, with, uh, with the lab. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk more about what's in these files and, and the lab write-up uh, does as well. Uh, but what I would like you to make sure you can do this weekend is to download these startup files, extract the tar file, and then in the terminal, uh, run the make command in the terminal in the lab zero folder, run the make command, and successfully compile the program. I just want to make sure that everyone can get that far this weekend, so that if there are any issues connecting to Mantis or getting things configured, uh, we, can, we can get those solved right away. Uh, and so more about, uh, about the lab and, and uh, stuff you'll need to know um, uh, to do it on, on Monday, uh, but any questions about the basic sort of logistics of getting the starter code and, uh, and getting it extracted and compiled. Yeah? Um, not, not really, like, I guess about the like, logistics of the assignment, but what's a tar file? So uh, a, a tar file is um, like a zip file, a way of just like pack, com, uh, uh, packaging a bunch of files up into a single one. Uh, tar does not do any compression, it just packages them up, whereas a zip file tries to make the overall file smaller. Um, and yeah, so there's a command on, on Linux called tar that you can use to create and extract these, these um, archives. Other questions? So let's have a few minutes. Let's do a practice with strings. 
so which of these types here correspond to an array of three strings? And uh, one thing uh, that uh, this is reminding me to mention is that an array, none of that now, uh, an array is the same as the pointer to the first element of the array. So I have, so A here, A is equivalent to a pointer to the first element of the array. All right, variety of answers. Please take a minute to discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about an array of strengths. So movement towards C. Uh, that's great. C is how uh, how we would would do this, where each of our three elements would be a pointer to the first element of an array of characters. Since our strings in C are arrays of characters, and we can re uh, refer to an array, uh, and in fact, it's the same as just a pointer to, uh, to the first element. All right, we are out of time uh, for today. Uh, if you have questions about this, I'll hang around for a bit. Uh, please uh, check that you can get started on the lab this weekend. Uh, and I'll see you Monday. Uh, drop off the flicker card on your way out.